Um, my name is Trisha Weeks. I work for Historic Environment Scotland and I'm here today to talk to you about two projects that are linked that we've been working on for the last couple of years, um, both of which are involved in trying to bring digital into cultural heritage, but in a, a slightly complicated way. We didn't start out to make it complicated, but it became complicated. Um, the main project I want to talk about today is the ALAP project, which stands for Advanced Limes Applications. And this is a Creative Europe funded project that we've been running for the last two years. And it's a partnership project, as you expect with Creative Europe, between Historic Environment Scotland, the Centre for Digital Documentation and Visualisation, who are our technical partners here in Scotland, with Edufilm und Median, who are based in Austria, and they are the technical partners for the Bavarian Museum Service, who are our fourth and final partner. The idea behind ALAP was to try and unify the experience um, when visiting heritage sites over considerable distances. For those of you, oops, if I can find the map, for those of you that don't know, I've got a point in uh, this is the frontier of the Roman Empire and it stretches all the way from the Antonine Wall here in Scotland down to um, Serbia and Croatia. It also goes into North Africa, but that section is not part of the FRE at the moment. The Antonine Wall is in the other map you can see on the far side. It stretches all the way from Glasgow through to Falkirk on the East Coast. So it's very extensive, very large. Most of the sites are not interpreted very extensively. They're open access, there are no visitor centres. So we have quite a few problems to start with when we're thinking about interpretation on site. We also have a disassociation between the sites and the artefacts that came from them. So when we started the project, we wanted to try and solve some of these problems. We wanted to make the experience much more interactive so that users could choose their interpretation when they're on site, the kind of methodology that they wanted to engage with. We wanted to allow virtual visiting if people couldn't physically get to the sites. And we wanted to reunite artefacts and sites because that's a really important part of telling the archaeological story. And all too often, if you're standing in a museum, you don't understand the site that the object came from, and vice versa, when you're out on site, all you see is a few remains. You don't actually understand the cultural material that goes with it. As I said, this was a European collaboration. That's the project team there at our first meeting. Um, we actually finished the project in March, uh, just in time for Brexit. So we started off consulting widely with users. And we spoke to schools, we went out um, to various museums, we've talked to people on site through um, audience surveys. We tried to reach as many people as possible who are both interested in using tech and not interested in tech, because we wanted this to be simple. And we wanted it to use their own devices critically. The app that we started with, the platform, had already been developed by Edufilm and Median, um, with funding from the Bavarian Savings Bank for the German Museum Service. And that really was quite simple. So the first iteration supported text, audio, video, and some very basic 3D. It was basic at that stage. We in Scotland didn't have much money um, before we actually got the Creative Europe funding. And what we wanted to do was take the app platform and then add our content to it. We then realised we could bid for Creative Europe funding, so we did, and secured 200,000 to work on adding augmented reality and further 3D capacity to the app platform and went into partnership. <laughs> so here you can see what our interpretive aims were. We wanted, as I say, to make it more interactive, to improve understanding and access to the site because a lot of the things you couldn't get near. We wanted to allow virtual visits and form the bridge between the, the sites and the artifacts. And also critically to allow live updates. So the system allows us to put new content on regularly. As I mentioned, the sites are fairly diverse and challenging. Um, we have urban and rural areas, both of which bring different problems when you're trying to create app content going through them. And we have a wide range of visitors from those who absolutely hate using technology, so we have to leave some interpretation on site, to those that want the latest kit. And that just shows you what we're doing. We also wanted to develop some narratives, and the critical thing when developing the app content was about making it unique across all the different sites. So we wanted to create reconstructions on sites, and I'll show you some of these in a second. Um, we wanted to look at named individuals and try and bring the personal element back onto the site. 
And we wanted to use the 3D artefacts to try and create personal history so that there was a connection between those um, visiting the site and those who lived there in the past. And we tried to tailor the different media that we used within it so that we had traditional text and imagery for those that were clearly wedded to interpretation panels. Um, they can use that. But then we added in audio and video for those that wanted to engage in that format. And then we added our 3D. Um, we have 360 degree turnaround models, 360 degree panoramas, site reconstructions, and we're just finishing off the augmented reality at the moment. The 360 degree panoramas and reconstructions have been really important in bringing the site to life, which is where we started from. So you can see here on the left, um, this is the reconstruction of Bar Hill Fort at the top. Yeah. And um, the 360 degree panoramas in use on the site. The image just below is actually an augmented reality for Kineal Fortlet, which is at the east end of the wall and has just gone live. So those of you who want to download the app can actually try this out at the moment. What we've done is modelled the um, 3D, modelled the fortlet in 3D and put everything there and it's triggered by one of the interpretation panels on site. So it's our first attempt at putting site-based models out and as far as we know nobody's really been doing much of it um, at the moment uh, apart from the work that we've been doing. We're hoping to extend this and I'll show you a couple of other approaches that we've <coughs> We've also been using 3D content in other formats, so the photo on the right shows you the site through at Balmuldi, just outside Glasgow. Now, you can play guess the site if you want. Um, in this top picture, it's actually just where the farm building is in the centre. So there's nothing there. Um, and when Glasgow um, museums were looking at how they could interpret the site, they had nothing. So we reconstructed the site in the 3D model that you can see here. We had to be quite careful about picking a point in time, so we've not actually gone with models that change for the development history of the site. We've just picked the point that um, the museum service want to interpret, so it's, it's not a changing model. Um, and we've shown so that's why if you look at the bathhouse here, it's a point frozen in time. The bathhouse did change over time, but we haven't changed it. And the critical thing is using it for an interpretive tool. So additional layers can be added through the use of the 3D modelling and we can engage differently with visitors. So you see here the interpretation panel um, that triggers the model for Keneal Fortlet that you can actually use on site. This is actually in Eric's um, house. It's, it's not on site as you can see, um, <coughs> because when we started taking these slides, we weren't at that point. But we've also added in artifacts, which we've been scanning with the Hunterian and with the National Museum. So this little um, figure here from Bar Hill We've scanned, and you can see here it exists in Sketchfab. Uh, so we've been using everything on the Sketchfab platform as well. But you can also critically use it out on site. So you can explore the model in the point it was found on site. And then we wanted to look at using the human element within the app. So we've done some motion capture work with various models, um, some of whom work for the Antonine Guard, some of whom are models that we've hired in and undertaken a range of different activities and different uh, captures. And we've then introduced those into the AR elements within the app. So what you see on the, the left here is uh, two different ARs actually but using the same action. So the one at the bottom was um, firing arrows and we've used that within a gaming environment that I'll show you in a second. And the top one is the same actor making an offering at an altar. So we filmed him using um, a model of the real artefact and then we were able to substitute the real artefacts into the AR. So there's both the altar, which is on display in the Hunterian, and there's also the cup that is in display in one of the cases in the Hunterian that is used to make the offering. And that can be triggered when you're at the Hunterian gallery using um, the, the display. And then, you can see on the right hand side, we've got 3D turnaround artifacts. Now they are being used both on site and also in the museum gallery context. So the object, which is the shoe, which is on display, you can see everyone looking at it in the gallery, um, is also shown in the app. And we have the opportunity to play around with it. We've been working as well with Maria Konamu, who is the digital manager at the Hunterian. And she has been using these 3D scans for a secondary project called Emotive 
which looks at emotional responses to museum visits. So Maria's been, we've looked at it from an interpretive point of view, Maria's been using it from an emotional um, and academic viewpoint. And she's then transported the artefacts into a second app, which gets users to take a journey with two or three characters. So what we're going to do when both projects finish is actually look at how we can integrate both the interpretation and the emotion into a final product. And then we've been trying to repurpose the material that we've been created, because obviously having a scan, having a model is fine, but if you only use it for one purpose, it's not really cost effective and it's not particularly useful in the long term, especially as we are publicly funded. So we've been trying to see how far we can use these across different platforms and different spectrums. So the Go Roman game grew out of the scanning and content development for the app project. So we were creating an app for use on site by quite a tightly defined audience. But while the guys, the, the developers were actually working on it, um, they're all very young and they got a bit carried away and they said, we can develop a game for you. And we said, okay. And they said, no, it's not gonna cost anything. We're doing it in our own time. And we said, fine, do what you want to do then. And they came up with a really interesting concept, um, which is the complete 3D environment for Bar Hill Fort, which they were modelling anyway for the app, but we then added the motion capture characters into it, or they did, um, I should say. And they came back and said, you, you need a, a premise for this. So what we looked at in consultation with an education consultant was a quest-based approach. So the underpinning work is based on the pure academic, pure research. So we did LiDAR scans, to record the landscapes. We created the 3D digital models with archaeological experts. Everything is, is right. As I say, we then did the motion capture, and you can see here um, the, the motion capture for the arrows, and then the final product that came out of that with the, the archers there. The spaces were fully reconstructed so that you can walk around the whole fort. We didn't do the interiors of every building because it would collapse the, the tech that we were using. People couldn't download it if it was too large a file. But crucially, we took the real objects and then we merged those into the modelling work that we were doing. So here you can see a window which is on display in the Hunterian. So we modelled that and then we slotted it back in. You can just see it's added into the building there. And we did that on several occasions to try and get the authenticity for each of the, the elements. And then the motion capture populated the spaces, but the artefacts also populated the spaces. So you can see here there are three objects there, which we scanned from the Hunterian that we then put back into um, the space. And I mentioned the quest-based approach, so we had to have some kind of functionality and some way of exploring this, this environment, this game. So we worked with an education consultant who came in and created two characters, and those characters have very different roles to reflect the different lifestyles within the fort. So one is a soldier called Julius, and the other is a young slave girl called Verkunda. And you can interact with them to undertake a series of tasks through the fort. And through that, you get into certain buildings, different buildings with different characters, and you get to meet other characters. When we did the evaluation and consultation work, we discovered that some people didn't want to play the game, um, strangely enough, mostly adults. Children love it, they, they want to play it, but the adults just wanted to explore the fort. So we built in a third element um, from the evaluation, which is the, the one with the shoe, where you just walk through the fort and you just explore it in your own time without having to beat the clock or anything. And we've augmented that with a teaching resource pack um, that people can download and they can use. And there's also a handling box of artefacts. So everything that we've scanned, we've also then got artisans to reproduce for handling models. So a school can play the game, um, they can then download the teaching pack and they can handle the original models. We as well suggest that they go to the Hunterian to view the originals and we also suggest that they do a site visit to one of the sites that features within the app. So it becomes a package for actually exploring and teaching. So we've tried to move away from simply having um, an adult based interpretive app for the site to actually having a suite of resources that use the digital in a sort of multiplicity of different ways. We also have a sketch lab account. So if you want to go and explore all the models, I suggest you go in there. All the apps are live. You can download them in either Google or iStore. Um, and do have a look. We've had really good feedback so far, um, both on the app and on the game. 
We've been plugging the game at Scottish Learning Festival and various teaching conferences over the last few weeks. It's going down well. Um, Eight-year-olds get it straight away. 38-year-olds don't, I'm afraid. So the teachers kind of go, how do I play this? So we have to find an eight-year-old to teach them. Um, we've also had a lot of publicity, obviously, in Germany as well. I haven't had time to touch on the German stuff, because uh, obviously today was just about the Antonine Wall. But our colleagues are developing a huge amount of content for the German sites as well. So do have a look at our websites. Um, and if anyone wants any further information, you can give me a shout.